We thank you that you have reminded us that you will never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that is here with us to comfort us as we mourn. But as we mourn, Lord, we do not mourn as those without hope, knowing that our hope is in you. May you come in your power. May you come in your Shekinah glory. And may you dwell among us.
Good morning, church. Hi, my name is Krisha. I'm the niece of Christine. Um, I'll be singing um, her favorite song, Give Me You. Give me you. Everything else must wait. Give me you. I hope I'm not too late. Lord, give me you. Lord, give me you. Lord, give me you. Lord, give me you. Give me you. Everything else can wait. Give me you, I hope I'm not too late. It's me, oh Lord, I'm on my knees, crying out to you. It's me, oh Lord, I'm on my knees. Give me you, give me you, give me you, everything else can wait, give me you, I hope I'm not too late, I hope I'm not too late. I hope it's not too late. I hope I'm not too late. I hope I'm not too late. Lord, give me you. 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 It's me, oh Lord, I'm on my knees, crying out to you. It's me, oh Lord, I'm on my knees, so give me you. Give me you, everything else can wait. Give me you, I hope I'm not too late. Praise the Lord. Good afternoon, church. Praise God. This is a very lengthy scripture, but I'll try to go as fast as I can. As it was requested by my cousin. Praise God. It's taken from Joshua chapter 23, and it's reading from verse 1 to 11. And it goes, and it came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. And Joshua called for all Israel and for their elders and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age, and you have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. 
For the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes. From Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off, even unto the great sea westward. And the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them from out of your sight. And he shall possess their land as the Lord your God hath promised unto you. Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that you turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left, that you come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them, but cleave unto the Lord your God, as you have done unto this day. For the Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong, but as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you as he hath promised you. Verse 11 and last. It says, Take good heed, therefore, unto yourself that you love the Lord your God. Here in the portion of the reading of God's word, we honor it by saying amen. I just wanted to say that this, when we look at this scripture, it's Joshua's farewell to the nations. But this, Christine is saying to us, take heed today. It's not how you started, but it's how you finished. And I know she finished very well. To God we give praise. Praise Like Miss Jackson says, it's not how you start, but how you finish. Where will you spend your long eternity? Counselor Lorraine Mason will now come and do condolences. And Dr. Adriana Hamilton, cousin of Christine, will do the remembrance right after. Shall we praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Shall we praise the Lord? Officiating Minister, Pastor Dunkley, and mem members of the Maypen Seventh-day Adventist Church, a special good afternoon. Christine's family, Christine's biological family, her church family, and her community. A pleasant good afternoon. It is with mixed feeling this afternoon that I am here to offer condolences to the family. It is indeed a reality that Christine was no ordinary person. Christine had the personality that a lot of people hunger for. And it was innate for Christine to be someone who was always laughing. I just want to encourage the family members this afternoon. Mourn, but mourn with hope. Because... We born with nothing, we die with nothing. We die leaving everything. But it's the impact that we make, the in-between. We have an opportunity to make right our in-between. I guarantee you that Christine had made a positive impact on her in-between 
just look at the congregation this afternoon, and it is evidence of how Christine was impactful with her in between. I just want to tell all those who can hear, love while you can. Say you're sorry if you must, but make sure that your in-between is as impactful or even more impactful than Christine. I just want to encourage you to be strong, to be firm, and as was read in the, in the book of Joshua by her cousin before, it is not how you started, but how you end. Have a blessed afternoon. Good afternoon, church. I just want to give a brief disclaimer that if you hear me lapse in my native tongue, just keep on listening, okay? Remembering Marlene Christine Henry, affectionately called Christine Muma. Mother Brady, Blackie, Blackie Pet, I will henceforth refer to her as Christine because I'm sure that many of you here today did not know that her name was actually christened as Marlene Henry. Marlene, woman of Magdala, star of the sea, a name that says you are a humanitarian, a generous individual. Whilst Christine, derived from the Latin name Christianus, meaning follower of Christ, anointed a Christian woman. I will hasten to say that Christine is more than a cousin. She was a sister, a mother, yes, and a father, a confidant, and she was a true friend. Being August born like myself, we shared many things in common. I sucked my finger, she sucked her tongue. Can't say what else I did with my finger. But Christine had the knack she had the ability to get any piece of paper, any piece of cloth, and she would never hesitate. Any cloth she catch, or any clothes for that matter, she would turn it into some intricately woven russet or a tight flower. It's, it's my wish that I had one of those um, artistic creations to adorn my wall this day. But alas, she got rid of that behavior or that habit. In the early days, when the family was living in Banks, which was about two houses from the main family home, or as we say, just down the road, Christine had a knack for timing the family pot. And as soon as the meal was finished cooking, she would promptly be there right at the back doorstep at the kitchen, earning the nickname Waity. But I think that that nickname was not quite appropriate because wait she didn't, she was always on time. In those days, most of you would recall those big cast iron pots or those big Dutch pots or yabba pots. And the pot cover would make this special clinging sound. We call it the pot cover sling. Christine had, I don't know if she did it, 
But every time something went in the pot, whether it be ground provision, it was a special cling. If the dumpling went in the pot, it was a special cling. And when the meat was finished cooking, it was also a special skling. So that as soon as the pot was finished, there she was. And consequently, she would enjoy two generous meals, one from her house and one from the family house. And that's the reason why today we call her Mother Brody. We had so many happy memories from playing with the nanny goats under the cellar to the usual dolly house and from walking home from Racecourse Primary School picking berries or as we know it to be Byrie behind the Exeter Police Station. I must admit, she was jovial above all. She was well loved. Traits I would further expand on. When the gods smile at the family and they move to race course and then to Maypen, I was somewhat distraught because I was still left in Banks Bush. As I wasn't allowed to visit Maypen in those days, being raised by my grandmother. I also had no business to go to Maypen because I never went to Glenmuir or Clarendon College. I went to Garvey Maceo, and therefore, my journey to Garvey Maceo never took me to Maypen. The situation worked to my benefit, sorry, the situation worked to the benefit of my brother, 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 who not only became brother to the family they never had. With Christine, they become very close, inseparable later. It's a bond that continued even after his death, with Christine standing in the gap, representing Brother Brother at Glenmuir at many occasions when Keeley needed the presence of a parent. It is also a bond which saw DJ visiting Christine and with Christine sending me many messages about how they were doing, especially when they visited. She would often call me with the opening statement, guess who come here today? And who a buck up in Maypen? Their home to my siblings and their children was like Grand Central Station, always a bustling with visitors. And Christine, would be in the nick of things. If an egg, then she is the red. She knows how to cook. And importantly, she knows how to cook for a large family. And in no time, something would be prepared and ready for you to eat whenever anyone visited. I don't know how she did it, but it all started with the purchase of the grocery and the market produce. She knew every vendor in the market by name. Likewise, she knew every seller who, saw, who sell their produce on Main Street Maypen by name. You need to walk with her to prove it. From, from Duke Street Bottom to Maypen, I am always amazed how many persons she knew. It's one thing I can tell you. She knew how to make breakfast. Breakfast is my favorite meal. And she knew how to, how to cut up, or the way she did it, you could say that she almost diced the callaloo. It was so well done, right? And she cooked. She knew how to cook that callaloo and saltfish, ackee and saltfish, so very well. All her kids can attest to that. Oftentimes, when she's visiting me in Montego Bay, she would bring Kalaloo and those hard to get cassava that can only be found in the Maypen market. She was a gem. Her Sunday dinners are the best. And every Sunday, she would prepare breakfast followed by her two to three type of meats that would be there and ready for the family at dinner time. She was there 
whenever you needed somebody to stand in the gap, reliable and dependable. I can tell you that she was there for me. I need only to say, Christine, I am going to a funeral in Banks. And she would say, pick me up when you reach Maypen. And if it's a Saturday, you can bet that she will be going to the market first and I would have to make time and arrange time to meet with her before journeying on to Clarendon. She was not only a mother to her five children, but she often played the role of both mother and father to them. And above all, she sacrificed for all her kids. Her sisters couldn't find the words to express what sweet soul Christine was. Her Auntie Queenie said, when I couldn't go to look for her, Christine came to me. She anointed my feet with olive oil. And by a morning, they, they were very big in the evening, by a morning, them draw down. Such was the nature of Christine's love. She knew how to show love. She loved her kids to the moon and back. She had a big heart. And therefore, she mothered a lot of other kids, personally assisting in their development or soliciting help, whether it be in the form of cash, clothes, or books. She just simply loved kids. She was chic, smart, neat, and elegant debonair, spiffy and sassy. And as we would say, she's well-dressed, trash out, and well put together. She was a true fashionista, and she loved handbags. And coupled with that, she was a certified funeral tetes. And as you can see from many of her many pictures, she loved to dress to funerals. Whether it be the classic cowboy attire or the high street fashion of London with those special hats and clunky trendy jewelry, you name it, she was always smartly dressed. She was a tower of strength, an indomitable spirit of nanny, our only national heroine. For when, in 2012, or 2010, sorry, when she was diagnosed with breast cancer, she set out to beat it. Her words were, I will fight for my children. She called them out by their name, as she wanted to ensure that they passed the worst. Those early days after surgery and during chemo and radiotherapy, even though very challenging, were very fun-filled, as she was supported by her sisters and mother, Nancy. We would often tell jokes, long stories to the wee hour of the morning and go out on little trips. I remember one of those trips. As she sat on the shore with the waves beating her leg, she said, me can't make the water catch me one, you know. You know, cause the area should not be wet. As she was still receiving chemotherapy. We were very carefree, just random girls, walking the streets of Montego Bay, joking, holding hands. Such was her spirit that she never allowed herself to be broken. She found humor in everything. Even when I got her to see the plastic surgery, she would have, no, sorry, even when I got her to see the plastic surgeon, she would have none of it. A one in me have, and a one in me going to continue with. I recall that even when she was vomiting during the days of her chemotherapy, she would still take the public transport as she wanted to be home in the morning to see her kids off to school the next day. She felt so accomplished to see her children graduating from high school. 
and she would often send me pictures. Pictures that would include the September morning going out to school, and she would revel in their accomplishments, and of course, boast, boasting a little when Ramara graduated from Glenmuir, and as well when he was going abroad. Shanice, when she initially passed for Garvey Maceo, and to Franklin, when he passed for Denby, Francine and Amani, when they both um, passed going to Ver Technical High School. She would also call me whenever Francine was in her modeling competition and giving me the details of how she did. It was such a bittersweet moment when I saw Amani in her graduation gown just days before she passed as I so wanted to, uh, sorry, it was such a bittersweet moment when I saw a man, um, um, uh, sorry, once again, it was such a bittersweet moment when I saw a man in her graduation gown just days before she passed as she so wanted to see her graduating. But I know that she would have been kept abreast of all the activities, the hairstyle, the, thing that, that the things that were needed for a photo shoot. And I know she knew that Amani would, have, would, would be passing the worst because in a couple of weeks, she will be graduating from their technical high school. And I'm sure she felt comforted knowing that all her children finished high school. When she realized that she again had to face her former adversary, she was fully prepared. She said, Auntie, that's me. She called me many names. Auntie, sis, doc. She said, Auntie, I am going to fight this. And at the meeting with her oncologist, she said, I am going to fight this. But as in the field of battle, as a true warrior, she changed her battle plan to match the enemy. And, and so, to know that Franklin was enlisting in the police force was one of such master strokes. And she began putting plans in place for Francine, Amani, and Shanice, as well as her grandson, Kiran. She was ready for the final showdown. She was ready. She got herself armed with the armor of God the breastplate of the Holy Spirit, and the sword of the scriptures. At her baptism, which brought so much tears of happiness to my eyes, when she was asked to give a testimony, she never prepared a long speech. Because for her, it was simply an affirmation, an affirmation of her faith. She simply said, I have been through a lot and no." I am ready. And that said it all. Her life was an inspiration. She never complained, why me? She constantly played this song. Not by might, not by power, send your spirit, God. I won't be able to sing the rest, but the other one said, you know my name, you know my name. Oh, how you comfort me. Oh, how you walk with me. Oh, how you talk with me. Oh, how you tell me I am your own. No mountain gonna stop me because you hold my hand. But this one, give me you. Give me you. Everything else can wait. Give me you, I hope I am not too late. Brought her so much comfort and gave her the courage that she needs while preparing herself and her family for the final chapter. But as we sometimes don't want to hear what is coming, we often ignore what was said and that we did.
even though she was preparing us all this time. Even when I brought her the chemotherapy, even when I brought her the chemotherapy medication that I so wanted, so badly for her to take, she would say, I feel too weak. Auntie, and, at some, and for the next week or so, she kept avoiding me. She said, Auntie, when you come down, we will talk. And in those few words, I knew she was accepting of her faith and she was fully prepared. In one of her voice notes, which brought me so much tears, she said, Auntie, Auntie, good morning. Auntie, I'm going to the hospital this morning. Auntie, I love you. Auntie, I love you so much. Auntie, I'm weak. I'm tired. But me I go. Me, but me I go. Me all right, man. Me a pee pee. Me not do nothing to jeopardize our relationship. Our relationship is too good. I'm going to love you so very much from the bottom of my heart. You know I love you so much, but auntie, my body tired. I love you. But me gone now, me I do good. At that point, I knew that the clothes that she had brought me just a few days before was her parting gift to me. And from then, I made my peace with her. Another voice note said, me tired man, I me feel weak. Me day I go on you know. No worry yourself. Me I drink up me green juice. God a God. No worry yourself. Another one, she stated. I am not doing too badly. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. How are the kids? When she came to my bay to see the doctors, Francine can always attest that she never stayed once in the guest room. Instead, she stayed in the kids' room telling them many stories about their dad and most importantly, talking to them about the reason why they need to be successful in a life. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Because even in death, God's name is to be praised as she never once complained. She never had any debilitating pain. She enjoyed life up to the very end. Imagine being admitted to hospital in unconscious, to waking up the very next day, preparing the family, telling them what to do, and showing them love, showing them so much love. She wanted to give hugs and to be hugged. Her hugs were so tight, she wanted to be hugged all the time. In the very end, when she could no longer sing, the hospital silence was being permeated with the words, give me you, give me you, as Christine was being welcomed back in the fold. Many in the hospital thought she was hallucinating. But we know, dearest cousin, you were not late. It's not for me to question, but to truly give thanks for the life and blessings that her 40 and 8 years radiated a warm glow of light and love she's shown to us. Gone too soon, we say. But the words of the Lord says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, said the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. With all the prayers and loving care of the doctors and nurses, loved ones, that was not the Lord's will. We can only pray, saying, Thy will be done. As it is in the heavens, so, is it, so it is on earth. 
So thank you once again, Lord, for lending us Christine. We ask for your strength to accept your will. I am going to truly miss your presence, a fun, jovial, compassionate, God-fearing, dependable, and trustworthy, a mother, a daughter, a sister, an aunt, dear friend, who touch so many lives in wonderful and meaningful ways. We will treasure her memories and seek to emulate her good qualities, keeping them alive in our hearts. Rest in peace, dearest cousin. Light eternal be upon you. I know that at funerals, there are some friends who come to support the family. They didn't really want to come inside the church, so they stay outside and they drink. Because of the rain, all those people have to come inside the church. But I'm asking you to remember that this is the house of God. So you come inside the church, but please leave the drink outside. And because it's raining, if you need to go to the back, please do not go on the corridor where it's wet. Please come up here and go through this door. We don't want any accidents today. We continue the program. There are four tributes listed on the program, and we'll take all four tributes together before we do the offertory. So I'm asking Jacqueline Jonas to come. She's aunt of Christine. Then Jason Johnson, friend, then Danchard White, and then Pastor Lennon Wint. Four tributes, please come in that order. The Bible calls us hope. Persevere and have faith in things unseen. When anyone look on Christine, they see a remarkable woman with a fine and caring heart. Who is beautiful in every sense of words. Her smile lights up the room. Not to mention her laughter, which is truly contagious. Christine loved it out any question. Strength and wisdom beyond everything I have ever known. For as long as I can remember, and still today, she's everything a mother, sister, niece, and a friend should be. Christine lay in her hospital bed with hope and determination. Never discouraged as the needle pricked her skin. Every medication her body had to endure. We all had mixed feelings and emotions. As we anticipate each result, we hope we would win. Each visit we met, I got to know the warrior she truly is. As her body endured all the changes, her face maintained that joyful smile. We watched her ride through those down times with hope. Christine would win. It was every doctor's wish to walk through Evans Gate, to find that cure to heal Christine, and to maintain that irreplaceable smile. Yes, Christine, you fought. You were determined to win. Though those lovely petals have fallen, 
the sweet fragrance will linger on. Sleep in perfect, pristine. Sleep in perfect, peace, black girl. Tribute from her mom. While traveling through this world of sorrow, many of the sorrows that we have to bear, but there's a prayer at the Lord's right hand. Give it a ring and God will understand. Your love, smile and determination keep me going. You are an extraordinary child. I can remember during my pregnancy, Dr. James told me to abort you. Why, Dr. James? Make you wicked, so. Because when he examined me, you were not getting any blood. But deep inside, I knew you were not dead. Upon each visit, he would say to me, are you ready for that abortion? You know, tell your husband, say so you walk with one dead carcass inside your body. But I was determined that I'm going to keep my baby. And so each time I went to visit, Christine would lay on one side, dead. No heartbeat. But as soon as I reached outside, she would leap in my womb for joy. I've not been killed by that Dr. James. On the morning of Friday, August 23, 1974, while picking beans, I felt a contraction. Called her grandmother, tell her how I was feeling. She called the nanny, then midwife, no. I was locked in that room with the prayer warriors, praying for her safe delivery. Approximately 10 p.m., my bundle of joy came into this world. No sound. That time he said to myself, he picked me dead for true, as Dr. James said. But half hour later, after some good slap from the nanny, you scream, me shout, and tap on my voice, thank you, Jesus. You were born velvety pink, and as days and months pass, your skin were changing for velvety black. Baby, you were my pride, joy, and confident. Each morning you would call and talk. You are a strong black African woman. Your picture will continue to hang on the tables of my heart. Although my heart cries out, knowing that you are gone, love you in life and in death. She asked me to do just one verse. Me picnic, Christine, pictures hanging on the wall. And when me heart cry out, knowing that she's gone, but it's got to be there, still hanging, hanging on the wall. Sleep good, black girl. Walk good. Love you. Love you, Christine. Me not did it. In a spirit, but me know me day in Canada and me mind the right day. Love you, Christine. Love you all on me picnic and me grand picnic. You know, take care. Love you. Mr. Jason Johnson. Or Danchard White. Good evening, everyone. I have heard of land on that far away strand. Tis a beautiful home of the 
soul built by Jesus and high where we never shall die tis a land where we'll never grow never How do I say 
Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to give thanks to the Almighty for allowing me to be a friend of Christine. And I just uh, give thanks that I had the opportunity to stand here to give a tribute to her. And, you know, I decided, you know, in my heart that I must come to uh, attend her funeral. And I started to pray. And I said, Father, do not allow the funeral to be on a Shabbat. Because I go to the assembly on a Shabbat and my job is kind of tall, I would have to try and get somebody to, you know, stay for me and to deal with music and so forth. But I give thanks when I heard from Maxine and Pata that they are trying to get the funeral on a Sunday. And my heart was glad. And I just give thanks for the Almighty to giving me a chance, you know, to experience Christine as a friend as a sister, as a mother sometimes. Sometimes, you know, she will talk to me hard and say, Pastor, you need to slow down. You know, and 
Sometimes it said, I go and tell Miss Winton you. Because you're not resting. I get some time to rest and so forth. You got to drink up some green juice. You know, and she encouraged me. And she is sadly missed. Uh, the Shabbat morning when I was about to go to the assembly, I heard the sad news. And in spite of going to the assembly to uh, do my thing, and this is one of the problems that I have with Sabbatarians, that I don't want to offend nobody, but when you come on to Sabbatarians, if your friend or family or stranger need help, you have some Sabbatarians not going around and say, but me, I forgot church when somebody need help. And I'm not into that. I went and I, you know, tried to encourage the family. Before I leave, I prayed for them. You know, and I am saying to us that going to the assembly that Shabbat morning and not going there, knowing that we live so good. When I need something, I can run over there and say, Pata, Christine, Miss Maxine, uh, Omari, uh, any one of them, I need so and so. They said, yes, pastor, you can get it. When they need something, they come and call me, pastor, we need so and so. You know? So I'm saying to us that a lot of times we think that going to church, let me use the term, going to church and somebody out on the road need help. We, we can't stop and help them because we are going to serve God. No, when you help them, that's the best service. Right? Uh, the Messiah said in uh, Matthew 7, he said that the least do unto them, you do it unto me. When did the African come? Them say, me prophesy, me preach, me heal in your name, me do all type of things in your name. Him say, me never know you. And say, how come you never know me? Because me have my people them out there. And you never visit them when they need help. Right? And I'm saying to us that we should be careful what we do, that we're saying that we're serving the Almighty. Serving the Almighty is to serve each other. You know, and I'm saying to us, our friends, uh, the word said that, oh, can you love uh, so you love the Almighty and you don't love the, the person that you see. You have to show the love where you see and love each other. You know, and I'm really glad to be here this, this afternoon. Uh, I just want to say my condolences to the family, from the Wynn family as well. You know, and I just want to encourage the family to be strong. You know, and um, Christine is a very wonderful woman. You know, and I just want to give thanks for her being a part of my life. You know, um, sometimes in the morning she would go down to Duke Street. Uh, most likely she went down to Brady House. And when she coming back up, I would go outside and say, Where you come from down at Duke Street? I don't have Duke Street, but I'm live now. She started to laugh. You know, and she said, Now where yourself, Pastor, everything good, man. And sometimes again she would go down at Duke Street and come back up. When she comes, she now go past my gate. She called me and said, Pastor, where are you going? You know, we have a good relationship. And this afternoon, I'm really glad that I could be a part of this to celebrate her life. You know, and Christine was a jovial person. Always laughing. You know, the only time I really see Christine serious, you know, is when she ever talk hard to me. Say, Pastor, you need to slow down. Pastor, you need some green juice. You know? She always said, I'm going to make Miss Wynn do certain and certain things to you. Right? But I'm saying that she touched my life. She's a wonderful person. And I'm really grateful to be here uh, this afternoon. Yes, thank you very much. I just want to say, just let me see everybody who know Christine, hold up the hand. Yes, yes. She's royal. Yeah. Every time you see Christine's face, she starts to smile. She's royal. Yeah. Every time you see Christine's face, 
She just has start to smile. Bless you, bless you. Community Services Department, an arm of this church, we take care of the less fortunate among us. And at funerals like these, we ask you to help us to take care of those in the community who are less fortunate than us. We are going to collect an offering now, and I ask that you remember that when the Lord blesses you, he blesses you to help somebody else. We will sit and sing the hymn, There is a Land Beyond the River, as the deacons and deaconesses come forward to collect the offering.
let us bow our heads. Our loving God and everlasting Father, we thank you for blessing us so that we can help our brothers and sisters. I ask now, Lord, that you bless all those who gave and even those who did not have to give. But help us, Lord, to remember that we are to take care of our brothers and sisters. Con continue, Lord, to bless us and continue to keep us faithful and true. In Jesus' name, amen. I now ask Miss Carleen Henry, sister of Christine, to come to do the eulogy. She's over in glory land. We all have to make it right now so we can be with her on the other side. God bless you all. Blessings, blessings. As you heard, I'm, I'm Carleen, Christine's elder sister. Life is but a stepping stone. A pause is in what's to be resting place. Along the road to sweet eternity. Our dearest beloved sister. A mother, auntie, grandmother, cousin, godmother, and friends to so many wonderful people. Christine, love and appreciate you all. Christine is the daughter of Crespito and Vincelet Henry Sewell. She is also the loving mother to Romario, Shanice, Franklin, Chin, and Amani. Also a doting grandmother to Chiron, Twinkle Star, whom she adores. Christine was born in a race course in the parish of Clarendon. She attended basic school, then moved on to race course primary and to A's RJ All Age School. She is the fourth of five girls. Christine, also known as Blacka, Blacks, Mother Brady, Mommy, Black Girl, Chrissy. She was an amazing sister, not only to me, but to each and every one she meet along the way. Christine was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2010. God grant her healing for 12 years. However, the parasite came back again in January. Even though she had that parasite, she never let that stop her. She was always a people person. She loves her family and friends. She loves to give positive advice and encouragement. Any of her friends, family, or neighbors in need of anything, as soon as she's aware, she will help or get her family involved. Carlene, I need this because this one need this. Her sweet charisma, no one can resist. Christine to attend, Christine loved to attend church, to wash, to cook, to clean, and to entertain. She was involved in every aspect of her children's life, and she was very involved in her community, etc. For years she's been going to church with our sister, but she finally decided to heed to the calling of a beloved savior in the footstep of her two older sisters. Gladly, she took her water baptism and commit herself to our blessed Savior. 
even though she was in lots of pain, she never ceased not to give God thanks. She was grateful and always giving thanks. While going through all these discomfort, she never gave up on God. So on April 29, 2023, God took all her pain and suffering and placed her in a pain-free garden of everlasting life. Our dearly beloved sister, mother, daughter, cousin, auntie, grandmother, and friend, we want to tell you something, but you can't hear we. So we are sending it on angel wings to let you know you're wonderful to think of and so hard to be without. We will find you with us in each moment when heaven meet hurt. We will feel your presence. Lord, our loss is so great. Lord, please send us angel to comfort us. Sleep on our beloved sister, mother, daughter, grandmother, auntie, cousin, and friends. We pray that your perpetual light will continue to shine in God's glory. We miss you. We love you, Christy girl. Sleep on. God be with you. To my two wonderful sisters, Parsine Henry and Alcyon Henry, thank you for caring, for loving. We appreciate you for selflessly taking care of our sister. Thank you. God bless you. To each and everyone, our family, wishes to thank you for your kindness, your prayers, your love, and your support. We love you. God bless you all. Thank you. We're happy that the God we serve did not leave us comfortless. So in times of bereavement, he has a word of comfort from the Bible, the Word of God. This afternoon, Pastor Matthew Hutchins will present that word. Pastor Hutchins has been serving the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a minister of the gospel for over 20 years. He's married, he has a daughter, and he's still serving. He's passionate about letting people understand that, as we said this morning, it's not how you start, but how you finish. So please remember that our God wants to take you to heaven with him. So as he comes this afternoon to comfort the hearts of the family members and the rest of us, please remember that Jesus loves you and he wants to save you. Before Pastor Hutchins comes to preach the word for us this afternoon, uh, the Maypen Seventh-day Adventist Church will present the song of meditation.
shall see him face to face, all because of God's amazing grace. Through this the rights meant a danger to, through labors and sorrows with Greetings and good afternoon, everyone. We have gathered here on a sad occasion, but it seems quite obvious that Marlene Christine was well loved. Based on the large uh, attendance we have here today, that is to show that she was well known, well loved, and I would like to tender my word of condolence to the family members and also on the behalf of our uh, senior pastor, Pastor O'Hara, who is absent today. I would like to say on the behalf of the elders and members of the Maypen Church and myself as the associate pastor and Pastor O'Hara, as the senior pastor, we want to tender our deepest word of condolence to the family members to let you know that we are praying for you, that we deeply regret the passing of Christine, and that on top of that, we want to let you know that God loves you, and that he understands your pain, and God has promised he'll never leave you, nor forsake you. So he understands. God is not a God who is only distant away, but he's very present in our immediate situation. The Bible says we do not have an high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but he was tempted in all points. But Jesus, my friend, understand your pain. So I have a word of encouragement for you family members. I presume the family members are sitting up here. I want to let you know that 
uh, God understands what you're going through and he will always be with you in your pain. So I want to encourage you. And so I have a word of warning for you. I always uh, share this piece of information whenever time I go to do a funeral about what we as pastors in training were instructed to do when we go to a funeral. First, we are commissioned to say well about the dead. That's the first thing. The second thing we were instructed to do in training when we were doing theology was that we are supposed to uh, warn the living, to comfort the bereaved, and mostly to warn the living. And who are the living? All of us, we who are alive. So I'm here, my friends, to uh, bring you a word of encouragement, also a word of warning. So I'm going to be very brief, but I would like to have your undivided attention. I don't like people walking about, or children moving around when I'm preaching the word of God. Can I have your cooperation? I'm going to be very brief. So my topic today is, comes to you in the form of a question. The question is rhetorical. That means it does not require you to respond verbally to me. But the question on my topic is, where do you plan to spend eternity? Where do you plan to spend eternity? I am here to submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that this world is going to come to an end. Whether you believe it or not, this is a sinful, wicked world. And so God, my friends, would be most irresponsible if he does nothing to our world. The Bible tells us that so as it was in the beginning, the days of Noah, he used to eat and drink, and the men used to plant and have fun until the flood came and took them all away. Jesus says, so as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. So I am here, beloved friends, to let you know that there is coming a judgment day. We human beings are moral beings. That means we know right from wrong. We are not animals. We are not trees. God do not hold animals and trees responsible. We have been made in the image of God. Do you agree? And therefore, we know right from wrong. We are held accountable for the deeds that we have done. Every sin that we committed is recorded with precision in heaven by the angels. Because the Bible says, my friend, that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So because we sin, we deserve to die. So there's a penalty for sin. But if we accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior, we don't have to die eternally. We may die physically like Christine, because the Bible says, my friends, the wages of sin is what? Death. So because of Adam's sin, death is passed on all men. But what is death? Have you ever considered what is the definition for death? Do you know what death is? What is death? What do you say? Do you know what death is, my brother? Death is the cessation of life. Life ceases to exist. So when you die... My friends, you go out of existence as if you never existed before. So there is nothing as immortality of the soul that when you die, it lives on. When you die, the Bible says you become dust. Dust you were, and dust you shall return. Dust, uh, life, death is a discontinuation of life. And so we die because of sin. Sin cuts us off from the source of life. And who is the source of life? God. But is there any hope for us? Yes, there is hope beyond the grave. The Bible tells us that it's appointed to man to die but once, but after that comes the judgment. So the question I want to ask you, this is a very uh, penetrating question. This is a question for you to do some introspection, for you to examine yourself. Where do you plan to spend eternity? I am here to submit to you that this world is going to come to an end. It's a wicked world. God is going to destroy. The Bible tells me that, that there's coming a day when God will destroy this world. So eternity, my friend, is a very 
very long time. Eternity is a, a, a matter of infinity. And I'm going to read something to you in the book of uh, Psalm. Psalm 90 says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, uh, ever thou hast formed the earth, and they were even from everlasting to everlasting your God. God is everlasting. God cannot die. God is the source of life. He's the source of eternity. We human beings have a point of entrance into this world and a point of exit. So there was a time when we never exist. But God has been always been around. So we are only here, my friend, for a short period of time. Are you aware of that? We are not here forever. And the Bible continues to say, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past and as a watch in the night. The days of our years are three score years and ten, and if by reason of strength there be four score years, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Uh, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. So three score, how, much, how many is that? Sixty. A score is twenty. So three score and ten, that's seventy, is given to man. And if by reason of strength you may live for four score, that's 80. And some people may live for 90, 91, or maybe 100. But eventually you're going to die. Because we have sinned. And sin separates us from God. So the, the question I want to ask you, when you die, what next? It is a relevant question, my friends. So life is brief, my friends. All that happens is that you're born from your mother's womb, you learn to crawl or to walk, you go to kindergarten school, then maybe uh, uh, basic school, and then secondary school and high school, and you earn a diploma. Or maybe you go to um, college and you get a, a first degree, a bachelor's degree, or a master's degree, and you are now 35. And then you get married and have children, young ladies, and multiply the earth and, and replenish the earth, and then you are, you are now 45. You're growing up, right? looking nice and bloomy and attractive and curvaceous ladies, and men are handsome and looking good. But soon after, my friends, your shape is going to change because you're getting what? Old. Here are going to fall out. The Bible says some of us, our teeth might be gone, beloved friends. And then you are 65. And you have grandchildren. And you have a nice house. There's nothing wrong with having a nice house, a nice car. God wants you to be happy and be prosperous and live a good life. Poverty is not of God. God wants you to live a good life. But if in that life you did not have Jesus, your life would have been in vain. So, and then you know you're 75 or 80. Huh? And naturally, you're going to die or I'm going to die. If that life did not have Christ in it, it would have been a life lived in vain. Do you understand? How do I know that? King Solomon, the wisest man ever lived. He was the son of David. King Solomon, you heard about him, don't you? King Solomon had 300 concubines, unmarried women, and 700 wives. One man had 1,000 women. Yeah? Solomon had gold in abundance. He had animals in abundance, land as far as his eyes could see. King Solomon, he was the richest man ever lived. He was the wisest man. Solomon, my friends, had servants born, grew, and died in his house. Solomon tried everything under the sun. And then he got old. And he said, you know what? Man's whole duty is to fear God and keep his commandments. What is your purpose of existence? Why did you come into this world? For what reason you are here, my friends? Have you ever thought about that? You and I were made by God in his image. To serve him, to build a character that will transition you from this world to the next. God made you to help your fellow men, to build character, and to be prepared in this life for the life to come. When Jesus comes, if you are not ready, you are going to be lost. That will be too late. If I were you, I would change my foolish ways and turn my life all over to Jesus. 
Question I'd like to ask you. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus as yet? He's the most loving personality in the universe. Nobody loves you, cares for you like Jesus. Your friend will forsake you. They will divulge your private business that you share with them. Uh, some things you can't even tell your husband and your wife. But you can tell Jesus. The question again I want to pose, my friend, where do you plan to spend eternity? Because after this life, we are going to have to face the creator. We have to face God because we are held accountable for the deeds, pastor, that we have done. So, beloved friends, there is hope only in Jesus. When Jesus comes back, which is sure, there are going to be two groups, the Bible says. One group, my friend, will be running away from him. Revelation chapter 6. That group will be the group that is lost. And the Bible says they'll run to the rocks and to the mountains and to the hills and say, hide us from him that sits on the throne. The other group will be the family of God. They will hail Jesus as their personal savior. When Jesus is coming, the clouds of heaven, there will be thunder and lightning, and there will be great turmoil, my friend, and the earth will roll and the sea will boil like a pot. It will be a dreadful and terrible time. Where will you be when Jesus descends with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of angels coming with flaming fire? Only those who are wrapped up and tangled up in Jesus will be saved. So I want to encourage you, beloved friends. If you have tried everything else in this world, you have tried uh, uh, the pleasures of this world, you have tried uh, uh, money, sexual fulfillment, huh? you have tried uh, the things of this world and they fail you. Why don't you try Jesus? He'll never let you down. I have accepted Jesus for about 48 years now and he has never once disappointed me. Listen. I live in Milk River, and I'm the designated preacher. My vehicle, my timing belt broke. And so, having committed to come here to preach today, I wanted to fulfill this assignment. So I was in Milk River even until after one, but I prayed that God would make a way. I never gave up. And God provided a ride for me to go to Tollgate by the police officer, and from Tollgate to here. I said that to say this. If you trust God, whatever you ask God for, he will do it. The Bible says in Matthew 24 and verse 3. That, uh, Matthew 7 rather, 24. Whatever you ask for, God will give it to you. Knock and you shall, it shall be opened. Seek and you shall find. Seek. Asking it shall be given you, my friends. So whatever you ask God for, he will give it unto you. So life is very brief. You can be here tomorrow, and you are what? And you are gone. So the Bible says in Job uh, chapter 14, verse 1, Man that is born of a woman is of a few days. Is of a what? And full of trouble. Be full of trouble in this world. I see you, my brother. He comes forth like a flower and is cut down. He flees also as a shadow and continued not. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come, Job says. So life is brief. Life, my friend, is like flower, a plant. This plant here, they come up and look beautiful and bloomy and nice. Isn't that right? In a couple of days, they wither away. Our life is like that. Don't think that because uh, you have money and you have health and strength, life is going to last forever. Life is like fog. Do you know fog? Do you know the mist? All right, I'm from Westmoreland. So when I'm descending Spurtree Hill, going to Santa Cruz, like 6.30 in the morning, there's some clouds or fogs. Have you seen that? 
Yes, and it comes up about like 6.30, right, my brother? But by what? 8.30, it fades away. Life is like that. It's very short. So you're not to waste your life. Because if you waste your life, young men and young lady, you're going to have to give God an account for that. Because we are held accountable for whatever we do. So the Bible says, whether you eat or drink, you must do all to the glory of God. So I'm closing now. But I want to tell you a story. I told it several times before. Uh, there was a young man who was successful in his examination, right? Maybe CXC or what are the local exams that are being offered nowadays? What, what are they? PEP? CSEC? All right. So he was successful. And so he came home and felt very proud, sat on his veranda. And um, his neighbor was an old man. His neighbor said, John, congratulations are in order, son. Now that you have been successful in your examination, what next? Huh? The young man said, well, most likely, sir, I am going to go to college and earn a degree. But the old man said, but what next? All right, I'm going to go on further and study and get my master's degree. But, John, what next? He said, most likely, sir, I am going to get a job and work and save my money and have a big fat bank account. But John, what next? Well, I am going to look for one of the most gorgeous, beautiful young lady in town and get married and have children and replenish the earth. But the old man was persistent. He said, but John, what next? Said, most likely, sir, I'm just going to um, enjoy life, invest my money and travel the world and have fun. That's what the young man said. But the old man was persistent. He said, John, what next? He said, most likely, sir, I'm going to get old. But after you get old, what next, John? He said, well, most naturally, I'm going to die. And when I die, that's it. Everything is over. The old man said, John, you failed miserably. Not so. The Bible says, according to Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed to men to die but once, but after that comes the judgment. Now I can read it for you, my friends, very quickly. If you doubt what I just said, it's found in Hebrews chapter uh, 9 and verse 11. Hear it, 27. Hebrews 9 and verse 27. Says, As it is appointed man, but after that comes the judgment. So the question is, where do you plan to spend eternity? If I were you, I would change my foolish ways and turn all over to Jesus Christ, the one who loves you, who died for you, and is coming back for you. If we happen to have fallen asleep in the first resurrection, you will rise. If you did not give your life to Jesus, you will not come up until a thousand years after. And so, my friends, the Bible says all those who die in Christ, those who remain alive when Jesus comes back, both group together will go up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall they ever be. And there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sadness, no more grief, but joy forevermore. Is this your desire? Is this your determination? Raise your hand. Let me see if this is your desire and determination to submit your life to Jesus Christ and let Christ be the center and the circumference of your life. God bless you as you reflect on these things. Let me hear the church praise the Lord. Praise the Lord another time. Right, we want to thank our pastor for such a lovely word from the Lord. Um, at this time, I will ask all family members to remain seated and will the rest of the congregation, will you please stand? At this time, I'm going to pray. He never fails me yet. He never fails me yet. Jesus Christ never fails me yet. 
Everywhere I go, I want the world to know that Jesus Christ never fails me yet. Our kind, compassionate Father, we truly want to thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and for the blessed Holy Spirit. We thank you for the rain upon the thirsty land. We ask you, O oh God, that you will rain the Holy Spirit within our heart in these last days. That as we hear these words from the Lord, for those of us who are here in this congregation that have not yet surrendered their, law, their, their hearts to the Lord, that we all will repent and turn to God and live because there is a great judgment day coming. And we all will have to stand before the great judgment to give an account for what we have done in our bodies, whether it is good or whether it is evening. So I ask you, O oh Lord, to send your Holy Spirit for those who have not yet surrendered their heart to you, that you will bother their hearts and worry their consciences so that they will surrender before the time of too late. That when you come, you will be able to say, well done. We pray for the family members who are here that are grieving the loss of their family members, families and friends. We ask you, oh God, that you will comfort them. We pray that you will help them to realize, oh Lord, that Jesus is our great comforter. And we are not going to weep as one who have no hope. Because what they know that there is hope in Jesus. Bless the families. Guide their going out and their coming is. Protect them from the snares of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. We pray that you will cover them with the robe of your righteousness. Set a mark upon them. Set a seal upon them. Guide their going out and their coming in. And oh Lord, help us all to surrender before the time of too late, that when you come, you will be able to say, well done. Because we know, Jesus, that you have the key of hell and of death, and the gates of hell can never and will never prevail against God's people, even if we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Have your own sweet way. We leave you fully in control and say thanks in Jesus' precious name, amen. Please be seated. How do I say goodbye to what we had? The good time. Forever's gone away And it's so hard To say goodbye To yesterday I don't know Where this road Is going to lead 
goodbye to yesterday. And I'll say.